Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Teresa Correa is Associate Professor in the School of Communication and Director of the Research Center Ciclos at Universidad Diego Portales in Santiago de Chile. Diego Gomez Sara, a graduate student at Northwestern and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Teresa in just a minute. In the meantime, I'm delighted to note that today's talk is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program, and the Latina and Latino Studies Program. But before we go into the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It, is all, it was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service and enrollment efforts. Let me briefly say how the seminar will unfold. First, Diego will tell us more about Teresa's research and career in just one minute. Then Teresa will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at any point in time. Diego will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Diego, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Professor. I'm pleased to be with you all this morning and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Teresa Correa. Professor Correa is an associate professor at the School of Communication at Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. She's currently the director of Research Center Ciclos at Universidad Diego Portales, which is the research center in communication, literature, and social observation. She received a PhD in communication from University of Texas at Austin a Master of Arts in Latin American Studies at the same university, and a Bachelor's in Journalism and Social Information at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Her broad research areas of interest are new technologies, digital media access and use, health communication, and media sociology. Especially, her current program of work focuses on two big areas, digital media access and the social, cultural, and psychological factors that affect the usage of information and communication technologies. And the second area is about health communication and inequality. Her research has been published in more than 50 journal articles and book chapters, and these research projects have been funded by multiple agencies in different countries, such as the Chilean National Science Technology Development Fund, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the International Development Research Center in Canada. Professor Correa is currently working on several projects. She has a four year research project about digital inequality and the COVID pandemic. Another project is about mobile digital inclusions and mobile phones. Also, she's working on a research project that assesses the impact of food labeling. And this is a work in conjunction with University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and INTA and Universidad de Chile. Professor Correa also works on how families and young people use digital media and devices. Her work has been published in more than 50 journals and articles, as I said. Some prestigious journals are the Information and Communication Society Journal, International Journal of Communication, American Journal of Public Health, Political Communication, 
Computers and Human Behavior, and the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication. She also has served as reviewer of more than 10 journals and research grants. Professor Correa was also a thinker visiting professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2018 and 2019, where she taught classes about women, gender, and digital media in global perspectives. So please join me in welcoming Professor Teresa Correa. The floor is yours now. Thank you so much, Diego, for such a nice introduction. What a, what a good summary of all what I have done. And thank you so much for, for, for inviting me to, to this initiative, to, to this seminar, Latinx Digital Media. I think this center is a great initiative. So thank you, Pablo. <clears throat> thank you, Mora. Uh, who are in the behind the scenes um, organizing this center. Um, I think it's a great initiative to bring us um, together. So today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the projects that, that Diego was mentioning, which is like a, a four year long project in which I have examined um, the implications of a key policy making initiative around the world, like policy making initiatives for, for, to address digital inequality have promoted um, mobile connections, um, particularly in Latin America and in the global South in general, but also in many other places. So I want to um, talk about the opportunities for reaching vulnerable groups and disadvantaged populations, but also about the implications and challenges and threats that this uh, initiative or these policy making initiatives uh, have. So, before I start to talk, I have to acknowledge and thank um, my um, my uh, team, my work team. I have I have developed this um, project with um, Isabel Pavez. Uh, we have worked side by side. I have led the projects but she has been a great investigator. So I have to acknowledge that many things of, that I'm going to say have been a product of the discussion between us and also many other, like many research assistants throughout the years. So I'm going to start with an anecdote uh, that ended up being a finding. We were with Isabel, we were interested in, in how mobile connections and mobile only use because the, the promotion of mobile connections has led to mobile only use. So we were interested in exploring the implications of, of the mode of access on, on digital engagement, on, on how people perceive online, uh, the online environment, how people understand digital technologies, their level of skills, their uses of the web, et cetera. So we were in our like first um, entrance to the fieldwork. We were doing like the first qualitative fieldwork. We were in the Andes town, which is in the lower lands of the Andes mountains, like an hour and a half from Santiago. Um, we were in the main plaza of Los Andes um, on a sunny afternoon. People, mostly older people were hanging around sitting on benches um, and we see Juan, we're gonna call him Juan, of course we changed his name. He was a middle-aged man who was juggling with his phone. So we approach him um, and we, well, after introducing ourselves, we ask him our main filter question, which was, do you use the internet? And he said, no, I don't. But we had been able to see in, in his phone that he had the WhatsApp application and the Facebook application. So we asked, so do you use WhatsApp or Facebook? Oh yes, of course. So this example is very revealing in a way that mobile connections and mobile only use smartphone dependency, it's also called, uh, is in fact reaching like more vulnerable groups, older people, people from lower SES, status uh, and those who are first time users or who are getting into the digital environment through mobiles. But at the same time, it is also revealing um, how the mode of access, which is in this case mobile only, uh, shapes people's perceptions of what is to be online and what can be attained um, 
and we will see that it also has an influence on the digital inclusion process um, and like classic markers of the digital inclusion process, which are like digital skills and diversity of internet use, et cetera. And it also is, this case is very interesting for us researchers who do uh, research on digital media, because now we know that the most commonly used question to identify an internet user or a, or a digital media user, which is, have you used the internet in the past three months, may not be meaningful anymore for people because maybe they, they don't realize that they're using, it's so ingrained in our lives and now you don't get into the web through a web browser that maybe we have to be careful and, and, and start like changing um, that main filter question to identify internet users, okay? So this, um, this phenomenon of the mobile only use and how mode of access affects diff different uh, aspects of the digital inclusion process is not only prevalent in, in Latin America, let's say, or Africa or Arab countries or the global South. Um, I here I, I put an, a graph of, of the US and nowadays one out of five um, people from North America relies on, on, on the US, relies on mobiles only. And the mobile only use has increased from 8% to 20% in five years. So it not only it's happening everywhere. Of course, this promotion of mobile connections has uh, meant that internet penetrations has increased in, for example, Latin America. And the gap that we have in Latin America with, for example, OECD countries is decreasing. So that's a fact. The case of Chile, case, uh, Chile is very interesting because it has developed this 18 million people country, has developed um, digital um, technologies and a digital media agenda since the 90s. This strong focus on, on coverage and connections has led to a rapid increase in internet penetration. For example, it has increased 20 percentage points in only uh, five years. And now we are hovering, the internet, the household inter internet access is hovering around 90%. And smartphones are increasingly prevalent um, the level of smartphone penetration is close to the UK, Germany, and Canada. Okay, so that's our case. And in terms of public policies, this uh, increase in coverage uh, has been strongly driven uh, by this digital uh, agenda. And one example of a policy making initiative um, that has caused this, this, this increase in in a smartphone um, dependency, mobile only use and mobile connections is the Telecommunication Development Fund. The, tele the Telecommunication Development Fund, it's a private and public, it subsidizes, this is a public fund that subsidizes uh, the connections with 3G or 4G mobile broadband in rural isolated communities that are not financially attractive for um, the telecommunication companies. So in this sense, many com telecommunication companies, for example, if they wanna apply for having a 4G or a 5G broadband uh, mobile connection, they have to provide access to isolated communities that are not financially attractive. So before we develop this four-year project in which we focus on digital inclusion through mobiles. Before that, what we did was we wanted to see what happened with the communities, the rural communities that receive this infrastructure access after they have received it, okay? They had not been connected before, they were isolated, they received these antennas with 3G mobile connections. And five years after they had received antennas, we visited them. Okay, and we did research and field work surveys and ethnographies and, and focus groups because we wanted to see what happens. Do people really adopt it? 
when the infrastructure access has been provided or not, and why yes and why no. And we realized that the level of adoption was low, even lower than the average of other rural communities that are not isolated uh, or that are less isolated. So the level of adoption was 37%. And of that 37%, half of the people were um, getting online only through their mobiles. And this was the year to, between 2015 and 2016. So this triggered us the uh, interest in exploring what this means. What are the implications of getting only through mobiles and what are the implications of this policy making initiative that is cost effective from a policy making perspective, but what are the implications for people and for the standards of the, of the digital inclusion process? Because what's the problem? Why, why I think or why we thought it was important? Because mobile use from a policy making perspective is a cost effective solution to tackle access digital gaps. It is effective because it is more affordable, quicker to provide, easier to use, it requires, it requires fewer skills. However, we know that it may open new material um, inequalities. And in this sense, it is very interesting that in, in research, in digital inequality research, like, we in the late 90s on early 2000 uh, scholars who do uh, digital research on digital inequality and digital divides were focusing on the on the access on the physical access and the digital divide was the difference between those who have access and those who do not have access it was a material a physical gap okay so then the discussion moved forward and and we realized that after people could be connected, but although they could be connected, there are inequalities in the level of abilities, in their perceptions of what, what means to be online, in the type of uses, in the type of internet uses, in the diversity of uses, um, and also in the outcomes, okay? So the debate had moved forward not to the material, but to you, what it's called the usage gaps or the second level digital divide. But now we are realizing that the material gaps might be still really important, okay? And now that the, this type of mode of access are differing and there are people who are just getting, are being online only through mobiles compared to other who are multi-devices or computers and mobiles, the uh, gaps, we are seeing some very important gaps and that's where, what we're going to um, discuss. Uh, even there are some scholars who talk about the under connection. They talk about um, access instability or even that those who are mobile only users may become second class internet users. So in this research, besides the digital inclusion, um, research and perspective, we also talk about affordances uh, because affordances is the, re the relationship between the form of access and how the users appropriate this form of access. So how this for the relationship between this form of access and the user's perspective has implication for the meaning, uses and outcomes. So the devices are the material form where, where it is possible to make sense of what means to be online and what can be attained. So in other words, it set up the rules of the games, but it's the user, the one who signifies it and appropriate uh, the technology. What are the methods that we have used? I'm going to, well, this um, comparison of, of mobile only users versus hybrid users or multi-device users, um, I have used secondary analysis of national uh, surveys. Um, I have used uh, surveys in the rural communities, etc. But the results that I'm going to discuss in this talk belong to this mixed method approach. Okay, so I normally uh, we normally take a mixed methods approach for 
all the projects that we conduct. And um, it's challenging. Um, so for us, it is the ideal because it combines the strength of both epistemologies, you know, the qualitative and the quantitative um, uh, perspectives, but also has some challenges. And, 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 we're, and, and sometimes it's hard um, to, when we are discussing how to approach a problem or a phenomenon, um, it, it's hard, okay, to negotiate between both. But despite the challenges and the tensions, um, uh, it's been very enriching and the results have been very enriching. So we started this project with um, uh, interviews, in-depth interviews with Ethnoth with an ethnographic sensibility or with no ethnographic elements. We don't call it an ethnography because we know that ethnographers would be very disappointed. Um, but yeah, but we conduct in-depth on-site interviews and we added um, a newer technique, like another technique, which is called like, digital tours, in which we ask the participant if they can navigate us uh, in their devices and their phones in their computers so what are their so we can see while they navigate us we can see their practices what are the applications that are important for them what are the strategies they use when they have to overcome obstacles they, because they don't have the digital abilities uh, to do something for example um, so the 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 good part is that you can compare and contrast their discourses, what they tell you in the, in the interview with actually what they're doing on their phones and on their computers. And after this first qualitative exploration, we develop a panel survey. Uh, this was a two-way panel survey. Uh, the first wave was a rep like, and it is a representative survey of internet users in both urban and rural areas in the three main uh, regions in Chile, which are the metropolitan region, uh, Gran Concepcion, Antalcahuano, and Viña, um, and, and the region of Valparaiso. But they include rural areas because for us it was very important to include them as well. So in the first wave. Um, which was conducted in around October, uh, August and September 2018, um, we conducted this first wave among a very large sample because we knew that re-interviewing them face-to-face uh, -face was going to be hard. So in the second wave, um, we had we wanted to do them in in 2019 around October, but the social uprisings uh, in Chile uh, erupted, so we had to um, we had to wait a little bit. Uh, we started in January 2020, uh, but then so we started face to face. But then the and an other unexpected event occurred, as in most research do we have to deal with unexpected events. So the pandemic and the confinements started like um, uh, arrived to Chile uh, in mid March. So we started like half of the sample that we re-interviewed in the second wave was face to face, and the other half of the sample was. Um, was by telephone. And of course, the survey mode in the analysis that I'm going to show um, was included as a control. So the first um, important finding is that uh, we realized that mobile only use was way more prevalent than we expected. We were expecting about 25%, 30%. And in this sample, which is a large sample, as I said, in the three most populated regions in Chile, which, which represent about 60% of the entire population, it was 46.5%, okay? And the rest were hybrid users. Uh, in this case, when I talk about mobile only, it's smartphone only, okay? Because tablets, are not as prevalent as we expected. So now regarding the opportunities, because we talked about the possibility that this policymaking initiative or this uh, promotion of mobile connections and 3G, 4G mobile connections and connecting the country through these connections uh, 
might be or is reaching uh, people who otherwise might not be connected. And in fact, yeah, it's what we found. It is an opportunity in that sense. We did not find gender differences. It is as prevalent in men as in women. Uh, but when you see age, we found that it was way more prevalent among, among older people. If you can see about 65%, uh, six, sorry, 75, 75% of people who are 60 years old and older are mobile only users. And even more than 50% of those who are 50 years old and older are mobile only users. So in the case of Chile, it's reaching older people. In the case of socioeconomic status, uh, the C1 represents upper socioeconomic status, C2 it's upper middle, C3 is lower middle, and DE, it's lower socioeconomic status. So we definitely see that it's more prevalent among middle, lower, and lower socioeconomic status people, okay? The mobile only access. And regarding internet experience, uh, we see that those who are getting into the digital environment are getting into the digital environment through mobile only use. About 80% of those who had been using the internet for less than a year uh, were mobile only users. And those, and about 70%, about 70 of those who had been using for less than five years were mobile only users. So what this means that yes, it is reaching vulnerable populations. It is reaching people who otherwise uh, who are traditionally digitally excluded. Now to explore the nuances of this and the challenges and, and how the mode of access shapes people's perceptions and practices, we conduct the interviews, uh, as I said, the interviews uh, plus the digital tours. And here I have a brief summary of our findings and, and these findings are published in are already published in, 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 a, in an article in the International Journal of Communication. So we found that mobile only users were less critical towards phone and being online. Like they consider this pretty much like a blessing and, and, and that they could be connected all the time and they could be where everyone else is. So it is a really an opportunity for, for communication and sometimes to, to pursue um, um, some work um, um, topics and contact clients, etc. So it was an opportunity and they were not critical at all uh, about being online. On the contrary, hybrid users, like one of the most prevalent discourses was that they were very critical about the threats and the pervasiveness uh, of this overabundance of information and, and the constant exhaustion of, of, of being all the time online. In the case of mobile only users, um, many times they lack the abilities. We notice that even though they might be, many of them could be like sort of younger or mid, like in the thirties or forties, they, they didn't know how to create, um, how to put the uh, people in the contact list in favorites or how to uh, find, uh, uh, so they would search for, for, for their contacts in the history of calls. Sometimes they didn't know to put their, the names of their contacts, uh, but they manage and they create shortcuts and they create ways to sort out the obstacles or the lack of abilities. And they were very confident about um, their, their way of dealing with the device. In the case of hybrid users, though, they were, they were more definitely more confident and, and they did not have to create all these um, ways on how to sort out the different obstacles when they lacked digi the digital abilities. The other finding interesting is that they did not, the mobile only users did not perceive differences of what can be attained online. 
um, so they did not perceive a need to change to another device. Um, we found this in many of the interviews that we conducted, that they would do exactly the same. So they do not perceive a need uh, to change. Uh, they say they would use, they would do it exactly the same, and they really value the portability of, of mobiles. On the other hand, uh, the hybrid users compare and contrast. Um, they compare and contrast between devices. They, they switch between devices according to the context in which they were. They were working or if they were socializing or if they needed to find something quicker, they use the phone. But if they, want, if they wanted to do like a deeper um, information seeking, they would require the computer. So they would switch, they would, they would switch from one device to another depending on the context and on the needs. And they would compare the advantages one over the other one um, all the time. Some examples here, I provided like a few examples. For example, in Andy, who was an urban mobile only user, and uh, he was young, 24, he said, to use a laptop is not something that keeps me away that as, uh, sorry, to use a laptop is not something that keeps me awake at night, as they say. I don't think it would make any difference. Perhaps I would use it more at home, but I would use it just like my mobile to watch videos, see movies, archive pictures. Marta, she was a rural um, mobile only user. She was 72. She said, the phone became my friend. The phone is my friend. I'm when I'm, I'm where everywhere. Um, I am where everyone else is. You cannot use it in a silly way. And that's very different from the hybrid users. Hybrid users would say it's exhausting having information about so many things and not being able to discriminate. You have things to accomplish in your day and you realize you were 10 minutes on the phone watching useless things. So they were way more critical about this overabundance of information, this overflow of information, it is exhausting. That discourse, that, that discourse was very prevalent. The world's largest library in our pockets, it's an opportunity, but it's used in a very coarse manner. Okay, so they were very critical and um, very aware of the, of the possible threats. The disadvantage, and then Gabriela talked about this possibility of comparing the disadvantage of the phone as is the access to content. On the computer, it's easier to find information compared to mobile phones. It's easier to copy and paste files, files etc. So this, um, this really shows how the interaction between the user and the mode of access really shapes how people understand the online world, their online activities, um, what can be attained. And, and, and the implications, okay? And that, and that has some implications. Regarding the challenges, um, so we, as I said, we conducted this panel survey uh, and I'm going to show uh, how the mode of access, mobile only use versus hybrid use um, is related to a key aspect of the digital inclusion process, which is digital skills. So first we wanted to see, first we wanted to see with the panel survey, and it was a panel survey with an 18 month span, how does type of access or mode of access evolve over time? So we realized that 41.5%, 42% remained as hybrid users between wave one and wave two. Then 31.6% remain as mobile only users. But we found two groups, which were the most surprising ones, just think that it was, this was 18 months time span, that 14% who were mobile only users became hybrid users. And then at 12.9% or 13%, drop the computer in that 18 months span. They were hybrid users and they became mobile. And we will see that that's, that change of mode of access became very interesting. 
when we um, try to understand the differences between both profiles, between those who were, who were mobiles and became hybrid, and those who were hybrid and became mobile, the results did not, I, we did not find much differences. Perhaps the, the, sample, size, the sample size was not, not large enough. Um, so in the future, now we are preparing to re-interview, but in a qualitative way, both groups. We are gonna recontact them and, and but to really understand the differences uh, between both groups and what made them to from mobiles become hybrid and in the case of hybrid became a mobile only users. Then we wanted to see how do skills evolve over time and at the aggregate level skills digital skills did not uh, did not change at the aggregate level but when you compare how the skills change according to mode of access is what we found. And we, um, of course, someone could uh, say, okay, but you are measuring, you're measuring skills. Um, so what items did you use to measure skills? Because some could be like totally mobile, mobile based and others could be uh, totally computer based. So uh, just to tell you, we, at the time that we conducted uh, the survey, we used two different scales in order to scales to, to, to measure digital skills and um, to make sure that the, our results were not contingent upon the scale that we were using. We use the most widely used uh, digital uh, skills scale to measure in surveys. And we chose um, the items that could be applicable that were a standard for digital inclusion process and could be applicable to both, um, in, regardless of the mode of access to both computers and mobiles. Here we see um, a bivariate descriptive uh, results where we see that those who were hybrid users in wave one and remain as hybrid users in wave two, not change their digital skills. Mobile to mobile, those who were mobile only and continued as mobile only remain with the same level of digital uh, skills, although we see a huge difference of digital skills between hybrid users and mobile only users. In the case of, um, of hybrid to mobiles, we see that those who were hybrid users and became mobile only users lost digital skills. And on the other hand, those who were mobile only users and became hybrid after 18 months uh, gained uh, digital skills. So now, um, just to be more conservative, um, we conducted a fixed effects model in which um, we compared uh, the subjects, the, the, the same subject in wave one, wave one and wave two. And, and we see that those who were hybrid here, if it crosses the zero line, it is not statistically significant, okay? So we wanted to see how mode of access predict the change in digital skills. And we see that those who were hybrid, the, the, the level of digital skills did not change much did not change at all. Same thing with mobile to mobile. Those who were mobile only users and, became, and, and remained as mobile only users, did not change their level of digital skills. Those who changed, those who were hybrid and became mobiles, lost digital skills. And those who were hybrid, uh, and those who were mobile only users and became hybrid, uh, gained digital skills over time. So, okay, as I said, someone could say, yeah, you're measuring digital skills. And we know that to measure digital skills is very challenging because it's so, like the digital landscape is changing so rapidly that it's very hard to keep up with the evolution of digital technologies to measure digital skills. So we um, wanted to compare uh, mobile and hybrid users, mobile only users and hybrid users in something that it's mobile based, okay? In a type of use that is totally mobile based, which is the number 
of mobile applications that you have used in the past week. See what we found here is this is these are these are results from the cross-sectional first wave survey. The other one were from the panel survey. These are cross-sectional. So we compared the hybrid and the mobile only users with no controls, just comparing the level, the number of mobile apps that they have used in the past week. And you notice that hybrid users used way more apps, mobile apps than mobile only users. Then we wanted to see what if we account for sociodemographics, gender, socioeconomic status, age, and I didn't include it here, but years of experience using the internet. What happened? Does this gap remain regardless of the socioeconomic status, gender, age, et cetera? And we found that, of course, the gap closed, but it remained significant, meaning that the mode of access is not only explained by your sociocultural context, right? That the, how mode of access is related in this case for a type of use that is mobile based, which is number of mobile apps, um, is still important. Okay, the mode of access is still important, regardless the socioeconomic, the social demographics, and years of experience using the web. But now, when we included the skills, we realized that it might be the digital skills, the thing that is explaining the differences between hybrid users and mobile only users, because the gap between hybrid users and mobile only users disappeared in the number of in, in the number of mobile apps disappeared when we included uh, skills so it is possible that when you access through a multi device or hybrid context of of devices you have more chances of developing the skills than when you access it only through mobiles now and just um one of the last results that I, I want to share with you is that we wanted to see how skills and mode of access is related to one of the um, type of online use that is concerning us, which is the misinformation or the spread of false claims. And why we did that? Because researchers, Researchers who are, who are doing research on, on, on misinformation um, hypothesize um, that it is maybe the lack of the skills, one of the factors, the lack of digital skills, one of the factors that is leading to the spread of misinformation. Here we measured the spread of misinformation based on, um, on, on false claims that had been widely spread previous to the survey uh, that had been widely spread out through social media, um, but we knew that they were false. So we asked them whether they have, um, whether they have read and, and, and shared uh, one of those four items or those four, four items. That's, that's how we measured a spread of misinformation. So scholars were saying that skills, may lead to the spread of misinformation, the lack of digital skills. But, um, but we do digital skills and we know that there are different dimensions of digital skills. So some digital skills are operational. They have to do with being able to operate the hardware and the software. So in order to spread information and all of course misinformation, but to spread information, to share, you have to have some levels of operational skills, okay? So we thought that perhaps, perhaps operational skills was leading to misinformation, like the, that you have to have higher levels of operational skills in order to spread misinformation or information in general and misinformation as well. But lower levels of another type of digital skills, which is called social or informational skills, which is related to your ability to discriminate between um, information that might be uh, um, that might be worth it or not, and um, uh, being able to discriminate between the sources of the online information on when you or 
or being able to discriminate when you can share an information and when you cannot, what are the signs that you typically look at to see if that a meme or news uh, that you receive through WhatsApp or Facebook, is it true or not? So, so the hypothesis was that operational, that you have to have higher levels of operational skills and lower levels of social information skills in order to spread misinformation. But now, but then how this, how mode of access affects this relationship, because we know, particularly in Latin America, that a lot of misinformation is spread through mobiles, is spread through WhatsApp. So we wanted to know what's going on with that. How does type of access, mobile only versus hybrid, interact with this um, spread of misinformation? And what we found is that mobile, so here you see the different levels of operational skills. And here we see people who are hybrid users and mobile only users at different levels of information and social skills. And we realized that mobile only users who have high operational skills but low social and informational skills are more likely to share false claims than any other group. Okay, so there were not much difference between the other groups, except from those who were mobile only with higher levels of operational skills and lower levels of social and information skills. So this means, and we have hypotheses for that, but perhaps the ability, this interaction by, based on affordances, this interaction between the form of access and your user experiences is also shaping and the, and the fact that you're able to, in the case of hybrid users, compare and contrast, um, compare and contrast type of devices, you start to develop this um, muscle, let's say, uh, this ability to start comparing and discriminate perhaps between sources, between a quality of information that you receive online. So in sum, uh, just to finish, like mobile connections are leading to a higher percentage of mobile connection and the, this, the promotion of mobile connection as a policy making initiative, as a cost effective solution is leading to mobile, a greater percentage of mobile only users. So this is a phenomenon that we have to face uh, now. Mobile only use, it is definitely an opportunity because we cannot forget that it's reaching more vulnerable groups that perhaps otherwise they could be digitally excluded, okay? But we also find differences between mobile only use and hybrid use in the perceptions and practices of what it means to be online. We also found that the mode of access affects a key element of the digital inclusion process, which is digital skills, those who became Mobile, who were hybrid and became mobile only users lost digital skills in 18 months, okay? And the type of access and the skills moderate for sharing false claims. Those who are mobile only users with relatively high operational skills but lower information and social skills are more likely to spread misinformation. That is something that we really have to start thinking about um, people who are interested in misinformation and more interested in mode of access and skills, but this is a type of access that is a type of use that is very important and concerning us. So it is possible to argue that mobile only use could be the skilling, particularly when computers get out of the context. So from a policy making perspective, it is important to balance the cost effectiveness of this initiative, of this promotion, of this public policy of increasing connections exclusively through mobiles, because it is an opportunity. You get higher coverage, but it also presents important challenges. And now after the pandemic, like not after the pandemic, during the pandemic, we have realized that, that despite people have been 
connected. And for example, in Chile, despite we can say that we have 90% of internet penetration, that type of connection is very unequal, but and, and in different levels of quality. So this leads to different types of uses. In other research, I have found that besides the skills, mobile only use also leads you to nowhere, narrower, to fewer types of internet uses, okay? It mostly, it is mostly communication and entertainment uses, um, but there are many other uses that, that are more prevalent uh, among hybrid users and not mobile only. So it has very important challenges and can widen digital gaps. And they have been very visible now during the pandemic, but we've been warning about this a long time ago. The other thing that is interesting, it's that first the skills should not be taken for granted once they have been acquired. If some contingent factors, some contextual factors, such as the mode of access changes, you can lose digital skills. So they had to be constantly enacted. And the other interesting thing is that those who did not change their mode of access did not change their level of digital skills de despite the past of time and experience. Because we hypothesized previous to that, that those who spend more time online, those who spend more time online and have more experience online would increase their level of digital abilities. At the, uh, uh, sorry, abilities. And we did not find that. Those who did not change their mode of access did not change their digital abilities despite 18 months of practice. So in the end, the device of access, the material gap still matters and technical gaps are still relevant and become even more important as mobile access rapidly diffuses. Thank you very much. I'm just giving you a huge applause this is an incredible talk thank you so much i'm i have so many questions but we have a lot of also from the public who is just asking us in the q a and also again if you want to ask any questions please feel free to write them down in the q a function that zoom offers and i hope that we can go through them in this last seven minutes so let's start first with Floor fears, and she is asking us uh, the difference in perceptions between mobile only and hybrid users is very interesting. How do you think this might or might not lead to the exacerbation of social inequality more broadly? That's a very good question, and that's one of the things that we really deal with when we are conducting this research, because um, from the user's perspective. We have to think that mobile access is an opportunity of being connected and people might use it for whatever they think it's meaningful for them or important for them. And they thought that this was a great thing and they felt better, they felt more connected. I'm talking about mobile only users. They feel better, they feel more connected, um, they felt that they had greater opportunities and they could manage the lack of abilities, they could manage and how to sort them out. So people would signify the, the technologies and would reappropriate the technologies. So from the user's perspective, it's hard to say this is bad because they could use it in a myriad of ways according to their context and needs. But now, if we think as a, as a policy, from a policy making perspective, if we think uh, what are the policy um, initiatives that we have to promote in order to level off the field for people, we have to be careful and say, as researchers, be careful. Despite people may use it in very different ways and, and the technology may be very meaningful for them, from a policy making perspective, we have to set up standards, set, set certain standards of what it's to be included. Um, so in that sense, yes, I would say that it widens uh, digital, like it widens inequalities, digital inequalities, and in the end, social inequalities, uh, despite people made appropriated in different ways. 
Thank you. Thank you again for the answer. Um, I have another question from Val Christ, and she is asking, um, if she's wondering if the findings you mentioned regarding mobile only high operational skills and low social information skills contributing to the spread of misinformation have various in their effects among urban and rural populations. And what are the implications of these effects for vulnerable populations? Uh, that's a good question. To be honest, I didn't, um, um, we didn't uh, uh, um, explore into the difference between urban and rural, okay, in this relationship between skills and spread um, of misinformation. And, and the fact is that, well, um, of course, it, it might have different um, implications according to the different context, okay. Um, in urban, for example, in our case, we um, we have to think that in Chile, most of the people live in urban areas, and we um, use items to measure misinformation that had been widely spread throughout social media and WhatsApp. So we could really know uh, if they were uh, spread also in rural communities as well as in urban communities. Okay, probably mostly urban. Uh, but it should have exactly the same implication if those misinformations are applicable to a rural context. So if those are false claims that are uh, relevant for people who live in a rural context, it should have a, a strong implication as well. Great. We have also very great comments in the public. Marisa Gallen, <laughs> she says, wonderful talk, thank you. And Matias Zora also, he says that it's an amazing presentation. He wants to ask you if you conducted any type of causal mediation analysis between mode of access and skills. Well, I did the, I did the uh, panel survey. Um, I did not do an experiment, uh, and a live experiment on the thing, but we know that from a survey uh, point of view, uh, so in order to be really causal, you have to do an experiment, we all know that, but um, we did the best approach that we could, which was like a panel survey. And, and we took a more conservative approach and we compared within the same subject, what happened with that same subject change the mode of access and how that affects their digital skills. So it's not really totally causal uh, uh, and like we cannot say this causes that, but it's the closest that we can get um, given the data or the possibilities that we have with the survey. We did a panel survey representative face-to-face. -face. Uh, we tried to do the best that we could to point into that direction. Sorry to answer. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, very delighted sorry. with your work. I'm, I'm very happy because uh, I had the same questions related to digital inclusion. Like we had this promise from the internet, like the world was going to be more horizontal, like everyone will have very easy access. But right now the challenge is about inclusion. And yeah, I'm curious. It's also in terms of how these digital platforms and technologies are designed. So some people have uh, better chances to use them or they can have um, more advantages, especially people who have privileges or they are from privileged uh, groups. So I want to switch uh, also to, we have one minute left and there is another question from Lucia Magis, who is asking us, uh, in many LMAIC, mobile phones plans provide free access to social media platforms and the internet connection is sometimes mediated by big technology. What is the impact for mobile only users? I, Diego, could you repeat? I really didn't yeah, I'm, understand I'm, the question. I, I think the question is related to since like all these, for example, telecommunication companies provide free access or like free data to use these social media platforms. If also it's something that could mediate or affect or impact the users who are only using mobile. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we definitely, yeah, there are definitely telecommunication companies that are provided, for example, to use WhatsApp for free and, 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 but we still, um, in that sense, yeah, you would say that that could help. Um, 
because of course we talk about mobile only use and we know that even within mobiles there are huge differences okay the analysis that we usually um, do we incorporate whether people have data plans or not in order to uh, kind of control for the fact of this different type of access even within the mobiles okay um so it's taken into account pretty much like the different levels that you can have like the quality of access within the mobiles. Um, so that could help, of course, in terms of like affordability, accessibility, affordability, um, that you provide these free um, uh, possibilities to use uh, the mobiles. Um, but still at an aggregate level, um, so it could help, but at an aggregate level, um, it still affects, even if we, like the mode of access, even regardless, the quality of the access that you have within it uh, may have an effect on the digital inclusion process. All right, thank you was very I clear? much. Was I clear with the last question? <laughs> yes, 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 and no, it was a very clear answer. Thank you very much. This was a superb seminar. Uh, terrific research, super well argued, very, very clearly structured. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Diego for great moderation. Thank you, everybody who attended, uh, for staying with us uh, through the end. And I invite you to uh, join next week uh, for the new seminar of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Have a great rest of your days. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me.